who is the head of the Norwich Institute of Language Education, Nile. Uh, we also have a partnership with them, so if you want to know more, do check it out on our website. But Tom is here today to talk to us about mediation, what it is and how we bring it into our classrooms. So I'll hand over Tom and thank you again for uh, being here today. Great, thank you Federica. Thank you everyone for, for attending. Um, yeah, as Federica says, um, uh, I'm here to talk about uh, mediation, uh, particularly mediation in the CEFR. So any of you who have uh, signed up and think you're coming to a, a webinar on uh, meditation in the CEFR, um, you've read the title wrong and um, you probably need to wait for another Macmillan session on that. But we're going to be talking about mediation and um, particularly the the, um, the impact it's had since uh, its expansion and, and the amount of work that's gone into it for the, the new companion volume uh, accompanying the original um, CEFR document from 2001. Um, in order to, to get into talking about mediation, its relation to the CEFR and then the uh, implications and applications of mediation, uh, I want to start um, by just re-establishing and setting some foundations about what we mean when we talk about the, the CFR and the Common European Framework of Reference. So we're all relating to it in, in a similar way. Uh, I know that the CFR will be familiar to you in, in many contexts, in many ways, but I just want to establish the way that I look at the CFR and um, how that, I think, will help us to look at mediation in relation to it. So um, we're talking about the, the CFR and why, why it's important and really, I think the, the nucleus of it is, is that uh, offering of a, a common language to talk about language proficiency, not just language proficiency, and we'll come on to that a little bit later, but certainly uh, removing that idea of what does intermediate mean or what does beginner mean and giving us a, a language to talk in a, a common way about the way students, uh, learners use language and the way learners may be measured on their language and the way we might describe language in terms of progress and, and um, all of this, this uh, these reference points that we have to make sure we're talking about language proficiency in the same ways. It's also had a massive impact on the way we align goals that students set for themselves, goals and goals that we student that we set for students, goals that institutions set for students, goals that national um, bodies, national education ministries set for students, the standards we want people to achieve, the standards that are appropriate for different uh, language use contexts in the learning of languages and the standards we're trying to achieve in the teaching of languages and um, also in the, the assessment and measurement of, of language proficiency, what, what we mean when we're talking about achieving a standard or, or setting a standard uh, in relation to this, this common um, way of talking about language proficiency. It's also very important to remember that um, the, the CEFR describes language as, as action oriented, as things that we do with language, not things that we know about language. So things that we we uh, we take language to do receptively and productively, and particularly take it into contexts and domains where we use it effectively. And that's something that we'll come back to when we talk about um, the role of mediation and the, the expansion of uh, the topic of mediation. And it's also a fantastic, perhaps um, the most impactful reference uh, resource, the reference source of the last 20 years, um, and its impact is felt in, in everything from teacher's lesson design to course design to syllabus design to assessment design um, throughout the um, throughout the, the countries in which the CFR has taken hold, it's very rare to find a, a test or a course book or a, a syllabus that's not described in relation to the CFR. And that is great in terms of talking about a common a common language and knowing what we're talking about and knowing that we're sharing these ideas with our fellow professionals around the world but it's also fraught with with dangers as well um we have to be really careful when people say uh, a test or a syllabus or a course book is, is aligned to to the cefr we, we see things all over the, the internet that says here is how different uh, tests are aligned to the cefr and this is this course is aligned to the CEFR and this test is aligned to the CEFR and this syllabus is aligned to the CEFR. We have to be really careful what that means and, and um, be careful that there is not an assumption that because it's aligned to the CEFR, it's the same as something else that's aligned to the CEFR. Just because a test may be carefully and hopefully um, accurately aligned to a CEFR level, it doesn't mean that it tests in exactly the same way as another test that's aligned to the CEFR level. The CEFR is a very broad description of language proficiency across a lot of community activities, a lot of language strategies, a lot of linguistic competences, a lot of sociolinguistic competences, and um, 
no test could ever measure the breadth of a particular CEFR level. No test would ever want to. The test would be um, uh, unending in its uh, in its length. Um, so we have to remember that anything that's aligned to the CFR is not the same as something else that's necessarily aligned to the CFR. Just because one test measures at the same uh, general length efficiency level doesn't mean it measures exactly the same thing as another test. Put that in another context, we would all, I think, agree that um, the three people on the screen are um, fantastic sportsmen. They all have a, a common uh, level of sporting proficiency which raises them above the others, uh, even in their own field, let alone in the, the rest of the population. There is no doubt that there is something that they share in terms of sporting underlying proficiency, this, this ability to, um, to move their body in and uh, to, to connect at the right time, to have this coordination. However, there is no way that you would put Lionel Messi into your basketball team. There is no way you would expect LeBron James to win at Wimbledon. Just because they have a level of common underlying sport of proficiency doesn't mean that that's operationalized in the same way. And that's the same with, with tests of language proficiency, syllabi for language proficiency, course books focusing on areas of language, whether that's general English or specific purposes or English for academic purposes. Each one deserves to be treated in its own right. And the alignment to the CEFR is a, is a general alignment of, of an underlying level of proficiency, not a specification that it covers exactly the same content. So be careful with that. And when you're talking about mediation, when we're talking about mediation, make sure that the way you describe mediation is solid in its own right, not just because it's aligned to um, to the way the CEFR describes um, what people can do in mediation competencies within the CEFR. Um, it's also remember what we know about the CEFR. We know that there are these famous six levels. Um, with the inclusion of the, the plus levels in the companion volume, there's much more content at the plus levels, but essentially people hang on to those six levels, the A1 to, to C2 levels. We know there are global levels describing overall proficiency in, in certain areas uh, and specific scales for particular uses of language, for particular interaction types, for particular um, contexts of use. We also know that the CFR is written uh, in positive language, so we describe what people can do, not in a kind of deficit competence model in which we just say what can't be done at a certain level. And we know that scales are hierarchical, so that if we can do things that are described at a B1 level, we can automatically do things that are described in the same scale at the, the A2 and A1 level. So there's that hierarchy in there. What's often forgotten is that despite these, these names that have been put onto to six levels of, of performance, they are not a set of six points, not a series of uh, um, of plateaus with vertical um, climbs at the level boundaries. It's not a question that we stay at one level and then we end a course and we wake up the next morning and we're at the next level. It's not a set of plateaus with, with jump points. And also, and more importantly, and more dangerously in the way the CEFR is presented, it's not a series of equally sized, equally spaced blocks. Despite what you'll see all over the internet, which presents the CEFR as, as these equally sized, equally spaced blocks of knowledge or skills, um, that isn't the way the CEFR works. The, the, the jump from one to another, even if we talk about jumps, the progress from one to another is not similarly sized, is not similarly spaced, is not an equal amount of, of uh, knowledge or quality of, uh, of language use. It's very different from that. In fact, we're, we're talking more about something uh, akin to um, uh, a, a scale of progress, a continuous scale. Uh, and these are very broad definitions within that scale. So it's quite possible that within uh, a particular level, there may be quite a difference in, in language proficiency between two, uh, two learners with that level and two learners who are uh, either side of a particular cut score, a particular cut point uh, that's been imposed on, on that CEFR uh, measurement, may be quite close in ability, but they have a slightly different scores in a test that's designed to be aligned to it. So we need to remember it's not similarly sized blocks that jump from one to another. Actually, where we put those level dividers is a little bit more, a little bit more difficult. And uh, we need to think of it perhaps in the sense of, of the spectrum. You know, it's easy to say, if I said to any of you, uh, handed over the cursor here and said, well, can you, um, can you identify where yellow is? 
then I think there'd be quite a lot of agreement where, where yellow sits on this spectrum. But if I ask the question, well, where does yellow start? There'd be a lot more disagreement. Some of you may say, well, yellow only really starts when the whole of orange has, has disappeared and, and when yellow is pure. Some of you say, well, no, yellow starts at the very signs of, of, um, uh, of yellow emerging from, from uh, what's red and orange in there. And similarly with, with any other color there. Yes, it's easy to say there, there it is and that's, that's, the, that's the color, but where does that color start and where does that color end is quite difficult to define. And in fact, even looking at a spectral on that kind of one dimensional or, um, plane is not, not really enough. We need to think, as, as my um, colleague in uh, British School in Trieste, Peter Brown, describes it, of uh, an idea of uh, a spectrum, um, but also a two dimensional approach to that. And the fact that we're not always working on um, different, uh, or we're not always working on the same aspects of language proficiency as we move up the, the levels. That at the lower levels, it's really uh, about increasing the quantity, the quantity of vocabulary, the quantity of, of language, the quantity of structures that we, we have the, the control uh, over the basic knowledge of at those lower levels of A0 and A1 and A2. And as we progress up, when we get into the B levels, we're actually starting to increase the quality dimension. There's no, um, there's not so much focus on the, the, the learning of new things about making uh, those the, the structures and the lexis that we have accurately used and getting them to, to use consistently and, and systematically and increasing the knowledge of, the, of their quality dimension. And when we return to the, the higher the sea levels, we're actually then talking about different domains of use and we get back to the quantity. How many different domains, how many different areas can you use your language in? Where does your language get enriched by the colloquialism and the idiomaticity and the phrasal verbs in English um, that give us that, that, uh, that quantity dimension again. So we know that as we're progressing up the levels, we're actually doing slightly different things in terms of, uh, of the quality and uh, quantity dimension. And we're not, we're not by any means um, treating every step as the same. Some of the things that the CEFR does does talk about in terms of how it defines language progress and how it defines this these uh, moves up up a scale. It talks about um, the length of text we can handle, whether that's perceptively, whether that's productively. We can take uh, we can deal with shorter text at the lower levels, whether that's the single word, phrase, sentence level. Uh, and as we move up the scales, we move up towards longer uh, extended texts and um, we can deal with much more receptively and productively in terms of length. We move from dealing with concrete and familiar subjects, the everyday, the, the concrete nouns, the things around us, the, the topics we talk about all the time, up into talking about fields that we're not comfortable uh, in, in terms of uh, knowing all of the vocabulary for it. We have to circumlocute and work around and describe things uh, using the resources we have, but we can deal with, with abstract topics, with, with uh, less familiar topics as we move up the levels. We increase the complexity of, of the structures we use. We're no longer at the single clause level uh, as we move up through the through the um, CFR levels. We're describing language use as uh, embedded structures and much more flexibility in the, the grammatical choices we make and, and the lexical choices we make to, to um, give our meaning across or to, to understand somebody else's meaning. We also have that dimension of um, developing our accuracy and moving from a, 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 an area uh, at the lower end where we have frequent error, frequent mistakes, and we're monitoring all the time to, to a level of uh, consistent accuracy where it's only those kind of slips which are uh, familiar to us in any language that we speak, that we uh, we speak, and you'll have picked up many in mine already, that, that we we, uh, we restart, we reformulate, we realize a sentence is going down the wrong uh, the wrong path and we change it, um, but we're consistent in, uh, in the, the accuracy of what we can produce, particularly in the written form. And, uh, and finally, we have this idea of um, uh, the amount of autonomy we're able to, to exert in our, in our language use, whether we need support from a, a sympathetic listener or whether we need support from a, a resource such as a, a dictionary or other, other support at the lower levels, the extent to which we can operate independently increases as we go up the, the CEFR levels. So we've got all of those things which relate to the kind of the vertical dimension, that progress up the, the levels as they're defined um, with those, those uh, now famous um, six, six levels and in, uh, increasingly the uh, inclusion of the plus levels in the way we describe language proficiency. We've also got a horizontal dimension. And the horizontal dimension talks about the range of competencies we might acquire, the range of different areas in which we can separate language into, and the range of uh, 
the range of domains we might want to use our language in. And you can see this is taken from the, the original CFR manual. It's a bit like a, an enormous family tree, starting with describing overall language proficiency, moving down into how we break that down usefully into strategies, competencies, and activities, and then expanding one of those out into reception, production, interaction, and mediation, just expanding the interaction down to spoken interaction, and then all these uh, scales which relate to that. And what we need to remember here is that for each one of those boxes on the screen there, there's a set of illustrative descriptors of what typical learners at that level can do in that area at that level of proficiency. So we've got um, this kind of underlying principle of CEFR having a vertical dimension and a horizontal uh, dimension. And within that progress, we're not talking about uh, standard blocks of, or jumps of the same uh, quantity or quality but that there's a, a relationship between the quality and quantity dimension and the amount of time it might take to progress through different levels. On that uh, family tree, that expansion of the, the horizontal dimension there, you can see those, those four blocks of reception, production, interaction, and mediation. And it's the fourth one of those which has had the, the most um, input and uh, I think uh, let's say development time and, and research and alignment put into it with the companion volume that was released in, in 2018. And we have this, um, this sense of how they, they relate to each other. What's the relationship between reception, production, interaction, and mediation? And the key thing we need to, to hold on to here, and it's going to be really important for the rest of the, the webinar, is that um, mediation involves the use of all the other language more language skill based ideas the receptive skills the productive skills also the, the the way we treat language interactively when we're we're combining those skills together but mediation itself is not a is not a language skill mediation is something that we do with our language competencies it's something that may involve linguistic skills of course there's much mediation that we do that is language based but it also will involve intercultural uh, skills and awareness it's, it'll also in, involve interpersonal skills and awarenesses it's bringing that to bear those things that our linguistic skills enable us to do and put them into a particular action-oriented space that we are trying to achieve a goal. And particularly with mediation, it's important that we're not uh, we're not so much concerned with expressing our own ideas. We're not so much um, sharing what are our thoughts or, or transmitting our own texts or, or receiving a text for our own benefit. What we're doing is trying to, to share that knowledge among people or parties who wouldn't otherwise be able to get that knowledge or have that communication or have that collaboration without our support, without us being in the middle there to support um, to support their communication. So we're less concerned with our own needs and more concerned with helping collaboration, communication, knowledge, sharing, information transfer between two other parties or more than two other parties. So that mediation, yes, it draws on all those linguistic skills, but it also draw, draws on other competencies, other awarenesses, other strategies that will bring to bear to, to help do that, um, what's described in that, uh, in that sentence at the bottom there. So, a little bit more detail of how mediation is described. Mediation described within the CEFR in three particular areas and, and, and um, three areas which are expanded separately with separate illustrative scales. Really, mediating a text is really that content, information, knowledge transfer, passing on that content because they don't have the language resources, because they don't have the cultural background, because they don't understand the, uh, the concepts, because they, they don't have the technical knowledge or the, the uh, linguistic technical knowledge, the, the, the topic specific knowledge. How can we put ourselves in the middle and make that, te that text accessible to someone else? So that's the mediating a text set of descriptors. The mediating concepts, how can we facilitate the access to this uh, to these concepts, how can we break them down? How can we make them uh, more accessible? How can we help people um, gain access to this knowledge for themselves? How can we build this, this understanding uh, of how they can do this more autonomously on their own? And mediating communication is the third one. How can we develop the communicative potential between two people? How can we help other people to share their own understanding with each other, um, with us in the middle at the start, but build them into perhaps more autonomous sharing in the future. So how can we put ourselves between two people who at the moment don't have um, 
uh, the the shared individual uh, awareness, the shared sociocultural backgrounds, the shared sociolinguistic backgrounds, or the, the shared beliefs, the, sh the sh shared uh, ideas or views of how things um, could and should be developed in a communicative sense. How can we put ourselves in the middle there and make this uh, this understanding happen for two um, for two parties? This is not for you to read. This is just to demonstrate that the scales now exist for describing all of these uh, these features in the same way as you'll be familiar with for the more linguistic based scales in the uh, the original CEFR. The, the free companion volume gives you access to all this rich language which has been aligned carefully to, to the, the CEFR levels that's broken down in, in key levels A2, B1 and, and B2 into to plus levels, uh, giving us a, a sense of uh, how we can describe performance and describe competencies using mediation, not just in that overall sense, but in that same family tree sense that we were looking at earlier, that each one of those uh, areas that I mentioned uh, on the previous slide, mediating a text, mediating concepts, and mediating communication, has its own set of dis illustrative descriptor scales that talk about uh, how we can do these things at different levels in the um, uh, in the in the companion volume and there's also strategies for which we might kind of break down some of those those competencies and, and support them with with the, the nitty-gritty um, the uh, the actual uh, skills that are involved in, in presenting that language or breaking down that language or making that language uh, more accessible to others so this kind of quite scary representation on the screen shows just how much work has gone into this for the um, uh, the new companion volume that each one of those boxes has its set of uh, descriptive um, descriptive scales at the, the six levels and, and often with a pre-A1 descriptor and uh, with the plus levels as well. So there's an awful lot of resource to get our head round, heads around there. Um, all of these scales potentially are, are, are a little bit um, overwhelming and off-putting. You think, well, how on earth can I, can I include all of this new resource into, into my syllabus or into what my learners might want to do with their language or treating this as a, uh, an area that's worth classroom time or worth assessment focus or worth including in my syllabus? Um, we need to remember, and this is, this is something that was shown in, just as the CEFR was being um, uh, sorry, well, the companion volume was being launched, that all of the, the studies and the, the research pilot projects looking at how these new scales would be put into to operationalization. Um, uh, Brian North made, made the point that when these new scales have been piloted, there are different uses for them. And again, there's, there's, a, there's a hierarchy of, of use. All of those scales we've seen on the, the previous page relating to mediation, all of those could potentially be applied for individual goal setting and self-assessment. So you may be able to look at yourself as a learner, look at yourself as a language user, and describe um, your own proficiency at a particular level and where you might want to go, what you might want to do with your own, with your own language. So, and the sense of self-assessment and individual goal setting, yes, the scales are applicable to everybody. Some of the scales are also potentially usable for teachers to assess learners' progress, to assess learners' proficiency, to assess learners' competency with these mediation activities. Um, so a teacher may be able to observe this progress, be able to measure this with their finely tuned uh, um, subjective measurement of what a, a learner is able to do, but not all of them. And only some of those descriptors, only some of those scales would necessarily translate into something that could be testable, that could be put into an exam and then we could ask someone to demonstrate that under exam conditions. So it's important to remember that um, we're not saying that every, every new scale, every new box that you've seen in that kind of expanded family tree of mediation can be tested and no, no more should it be. It may be included in self-assessment work, in, in individual goal setting. Some of them might be useful for, for, uh, uh, for teachers to look at progress and to describe progress and to measure progress. And some of them, a very smaller amount, may be testable in a more formal exam setting. But it's not that everything is, is testable. So one more thing to make clear about the way language mediation is described. And this is a really crucial point. Uh, it's, it's very um, common from the, the way that the original CEFR document was, 
was interpreted was to think about mediation as, as purely about cross-linguistic mediation, about taking, uh, about being in the middle of two separate languages and being the, uh, the conduit, the communicator of, of uh, understanding from one language to another. Yes, that's possible. Language A and language B is there as they're written in the descriptors. And you can see an example descriptor here at the, uh, at the bottom. Language A and language B may well be two different languages. However, they may be two varieties of the same language, two registers, two different sets of uh, you know, technical specification with the same variety of language or any combination of the above. So that transition from formal to informal, that transition from um, legalese to, to layman's terms, that transition from um, a very dense, complex academic text into something that's accessible um, to, to someone without the specialist knowledge. All of those are also to be described by the terms language A and language B. So we can start to move away from thinking this as purely a cross-linguistic mediation way of describing language and towards a way of thinking this is actually something that we need to do um, in many professional contexts, in many academic contexts, much of what we what we actually need to do, whether this is in our second language, or our third language, or even in our first language, much of the way we approach language use is actually putting ourselves in this space between language that someone can't access for a particular reason, and us being the, the facilitator of understanding that, that content, that knowledge, that communicative aim, that, uh, that collaborative outcome. So if we can put ourselves in the middle uh, in terms of specialist knowledge we have, uh, and uh, that knowledge somebody else doesn't have, there are um, that's that's doing mediation for professional purposes, and that's why I think it's so important because it has such a real world impact on the way we use language every day. There are all sorts of different reasons why um, communication may may uh, break down without our support in the middle. There, um, some of those ways in which we in real life might. Uh, might support understanding between person A and person C might be because yes they have different languages and, and so we need to, to mediate between two languages but it may be because they have different language levels and we there with the understanding of what uh, accommodation might be necessary by person C to understand the language that uh, the language that person A is using it may be because they have different subject knowledge it may be because one person is talking um, about something that's conceptually quite challenging. If you've ever talked to uh, an IT guy at your work and then been responsible for sharing that with, with colleagues, you'll know that the, the amount of knowledge you have about what's being talked about is often key to, to understanding the, the principles of the, the community of aim. It may be that the fields that you're working in have very specific jargon that you, you find yourself um, searching for ways to, to circumlocate, circumlocute or, or to, to use those kind of um, generic terms like stuff and thing and kind of all of these things that allow us to, to access language jargon and make it more accessible for other people. It may be because those two people have different learning needs. If we take it down to a, a classroom context, it may be that those people have preferences for learning in a particular way. It may be that they access information much more um, independently on their own, or maybe they're, they're much more uh, reflective uh, thinkers and they need time to process things, uh, rather than another person who's more impulsive and can, can give you a response right away. It may be that we need to mediate between those different ways of accessing information. It may be a cultural, Difference. It may be that someone's familiar with doing something in a particular way, but doesn't understand how someone else might do that in a different way. Um, we see this in all aspects of, of life when we're, we're, we make an assumption that people um, will treat a, a piece of information or an idea in the same way. But then actually we, we grow to realize that there's something um, deeper in, in background and in what you're familiar with and what you're comfortable with culturally that allows you to process things in very different ways. And understanding that is part of our intercultural awareness, uh, uh, supporting the, the ways we can mediate between different people. It may be mediating between different ages because people look at things differently. Uh, I'm not going to get into the, the controversy of kind of digital natives and, and digital immigrants, uh, but we, we see that some people might have different conceptual levels of understanding um, that we may need to, to, to bring down to a particular level or we may need to explain in different words, we may need to use different examples to, to make it relevant. And of course, people may have different opinions. People may not see um, that somebody else's opinion is strongly held or um, 
uh, has, has put them into a particular way of looking at the world and, and maybe we need to, to, to show them examples and, and draw their ideas to a different uh, standpoint to, um, to allow them to communicate effectively or to collaborate effectively with somebody else. So we've got all these reasons why um, mediation happens in real life and why we particularly would want to have the skills to put ourselves in between these two people whose, whose communication is failing without our support. I'm going to take this right down to, to, to our level as uh, what I hope that many of you are uh, in this webinar as um, language education professionals and particularly language teachers and ask you um, just to, to answer um, the following question. I'm going to show you some, um, some things that a teacher might do as part of their professional practice. And I want to know if you're a teacher yourself, have you done any of these things? If you're a, a teacher trainer, observer, a manager of teachers, have you, have you seen these things being done in a language classroom? So we're thinking about the professional practices that teachers employ in their, in their, daily, in their daily work. Hopefully you'll be able to see these. I'm gonna give you a, a couple of minutes just to look through them. And remember, all you're doing is saying, is this something that sounds familiar to me in terms of teacher practice? Is this something we would expect a teacher to do? Not necessarily every day, every lesson, but is this something we'd expect a teacher to be able to do as part of their practice? Okay, so I'm not saying that um, necessarily all of these things will be done in every lesson by every teacher, but I think you probably agree that most of these things uh, strike a chord of familiarity, that you think, okay, a teacher uh, should be able, to, uh, and, uh, be able to do these things as part of their professional practice. Part of the competences they have as a, a teacher is to be able to do things like this. I'd even go so far as to say, it's quite hard to be a, an effective teacher if you're unable to do some of these things or, or most of these things. If you're unable to, to, um, to operationalize these, these uh, kind of concepts of, of what a teacher might do in the classroom, your, your effectiveness of a teacher is going to be diminished. I think you need to be able to take texts and uh, summarize them. You need to be able to uh, intervene between students who disagree about things. You need to be able to design activities that get students aware of a topic and so on through there. Um, so these are kind of very teacher focused uh, activities that they might do in a classroom or, or uh, before the class. Let's try and relate them um, to some kind of more abstract descriptions of what a teacher is actually doing when they do this. So on the next slide, you're going to see the same nine boxes with the same descriptions of what a teacher might do as part of their uh, professional practice. And you're going to see nine um, <coughs> kind of conceptual descriptions of what the teacher is actually doing when they do the thing in the boxes. And what I'd like you to do is to spend a couple of minutes trying to match the abstract descriptor with the content of the box. So as, as good language teachers and, and good language users, you'll, be, you'll, you'll love a matching activity. We use them all the time in, uh, in teaching and learning. Uh, hopefully you were successful at that and you were able to see how these kind of more abstract concepts can be applied to the things we do in our, in our daily or, or our common professional practice as teachers.
let's just have a quick review of these. I, I think we should be able to see uh, them broken down here. So hopefully you saw that if we take an authentic <coughs> academic text perhaps and summarize it by adding examples, drawing attention to certain aspects, um, glossing them more, uh, more usefully, um, giving real life examples, then what we're actually doing is we're amplifying a dense text. When two students are disagreeing about something uh, in the classroom, when we're um, trying to, uh, to resolve an argument, then what we're actually doing is facilitating the communication between them in disagreements or in delicate situations. Their, their disagreement is that delicate situation in the classroom context. When we're setting up a, an activity to, to bring students knowledge about a topic to bear, we're linking to their previous knowledge. We're asking them what they, they, uh, what they know about the world and how that might relate to the topic uh, of the lesson. When we're um, inviting students to discuss grammatical choice in, in language and, and uh, the way language is used, we're actually asking, um, we're encouraging conceptual talk amongst other We're encouraging them to talk about um, meta language and the way language is used and the way choices are made in terms of the grammar, um, uh, the grammar and the lexis we use. When we do something uh, that's visual, and we we take um, we take a, a timeline and we explain the timeline verbally. We're explaining this data representation on the board of the timeline of different times and its relation to tense and its relation to language. We're explaining that data on the board through through the way we uh, the speech we use in the, in the classroom. When we write reports, we're pulling out specific information from our students' performance and we're relaying that through the form of writing, whether that's a paragraph level or whole report level or sentence level, or whether we're just borrowing um, pre-prepared descriptors, we're still relaying information about students in writing. Um, when we're setting up a debate or setting up any activity that involves the students working together, conducting that feedback, bringing it all together, seeing what's what's been successfully done and what needs more support, we're leading group work when we're inviting learners to bring themselves and their own culture into a classroom context and, and talk about a particular topic of, of cultural relevance to them, then we're facilitating that pluricultural space. We're making a space available for students to, to be proud of and to share and to, to value their own cultural background. Um, and when we're taking a, a grammar reference book and we're, we're reading that in, in uh, language that's designed for teachers to understand that teacherese because we're familiar with you know, terms like preposition and tense and, uh, and um, gerund and uh, subjunctive and conditional. We, we know this language, but that's not necessarily how we present it to our students. So we adapt that language and we present that language in, in other ways to our students. Now, what's interesting here is if you followed me and you're, you're happy with the, the, um, the concepts I've presented, then what you've just done is proven that teachers are fantastic mediators because all of those things on the left here are the mediation, the, the names of the um, the mediation descriptive scales. All of those, uh, all of those areas on the left are uh, contain a set of illustrative descriptors at levels um, A1 through to, to C1 or C2, describing uh, mediation competences. And if teachers do these, and teachers do these every day as part of their professional practice, teachers are great mediators. In fact, I go so far as to say that without being a great mediator, it's very hard to be a good teacher. Teachers do these mediation skills all the time in their professional practice. We are fantastic at um, doing all of the things that are described as, uh, as mediation competencies in the companion volume. So we have a huge advantage. We have a, a great um, resource to bring to bear because we understand what mediation looks like in professional practice. However, not everybody, not every learner is lucky enough to grow up and become a teacher. I know, it's, it's a shame for them, but some of them will go on to other less worthy fields of endeavor in their lives. And uh, they don't all have these uh, fantastic mediation competencies that we have as teachers. So how can we take those, those competencies and make them part of what we impart to learners? Because we can see in a field like teaching how, how valuable they are, how important they are to our professional practice, but it applies across professions, that actually the real world professional use of language is very much influenced by what we do as a mediation competence. It's actually quite rare in many professions to be creating new language, creating new ideas. What you're often doing in, in many professional uh, areas is information transfer, transferring knowledge from one area to another, adapting that knowledge, adding your own parts to that knowledge, but not creating entirely new concepts every day. It would be a, a kind of a, um, a very tiring job where every day you went into it, you had to create concepts anew and you were not 
Um, you are not taking existing concepts. You are not standing on the shoulders of giants, or you're having to reinvent the wheel, or whatever, uh, whatever analogy you're comfortable with. So, how can we do this in the classroom? How can we um, how can we make these uh, competencies accessible to learners? Well, I think we need to take a fairly structured approach to it. We need to think about what competency we're describing. We need to look at the illustrative scale that um, we're, we're focusing on. We need to take the descriptor at the level we're particularly interested in, and we need to build that out into a lesson plan, and then we need to describe uh, how we might assess that. So I'm going to give you a little run through of the, this process in, in operation. So let's say we're going from competency, and I've described that um, we're going to look at the, the mediation competency, which is called facilitating communication in delicate situations and agreements. This is um, one of the, the scales in the uh, companion volume under mediation. At the A-levels, essentially learners can recognize that there's a disagreement that's happening. At the B-levels, they can find out why that's happening, show that they understand the differences of opinion, and get more information from them. As they move up through the B-levels, they can take those issues and represent them to, to the other party. They can look for things that are shared. They can uh, suggest possible ways out and they can they can draw uh, something from uh, uh, draw an agreement out of the parties involved. And at the uh, at the higher levels, um, they have the kind of interpersonal skills and the linguistic skills to 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 be very diplomatic about this and to lead people to kind of uh, happiness with the compromise rather than just accepting something that's been um, developed. So this is what we're talking about. This is how progress in this particular scale is described in, in the, the CEFR levels. So we need to take this, this competency as it's described here, and we're going to focus in on a particular level. So we're going to focus in on something that's around about the B2 level. Um, and here are the specific descriptors uh, of what this uh, particular competency looks like at B2 level. Well, that's, you can see the, the, the fine white line describing and uh, sorry um, discriminating between B2 and B2 plus. So we have this three can do statements, can by asking questions identify common ground, can outline the main points in disagreement, and can summarize the statements made by the two sides. So these are the kind of the functional uh, outcomes that I want to see uh, my learners doing and to measure how well they're doing those things. That will give me a, a sense of whether they've achieved those um, those uh, mediation outcomes within the within the lesson and here's my lesson structure that I've chosen so um, I've decided to I'm going to focus in on workplace contact uh, workplace conflict so let's say this is a, a an English for professional purposes class and we're, we're talking at uh, with learners who perhaps come from from different professional areas but they have a, a shared concept of this idea of conflict that might arise in a workplace you can Think about staff rooms if you want to relate it to your own workplace or, or uh, management rooms or any other educational setting. But the idea that workplace conflicts arise is, is fairly um, fairly shared, I think, globally and uh, across uh, organizations. So they've read a little article on this before the lesson. In the, in the lesson, they discuss the article with someone else who's, who's read the article. We talk about the, the conflicts as, as the teacher becomes involved and elicits how uh, we might resolve these conflicts. As a teacher, we set up the idea of critical incidents, ask the students to role play a couple of critical incidents where they have a particular conflict and they play a particular role within that conflict, either one side of the conflict or the other side of the conflict or the mediator within that conflict. The students repl replay that critical incident, perhaps without any language input and language support if we're taking a kind of a pure task-based approach to this structure. The students share back with the, the whole group what they found difficult, what they found easy about mediating in that critical incident, what they found difficult and easy about sharing their own idea and how the mediator uh, facilitated that. Um, that. At that point, the teacher can uh, notice the differences in, in successful outcomes and, and less successful mediation, feeding in the, the language that might be useful, the strategies, the little uh, functional exponents of language which might support, um, which might support uh, the uh, the successful um, conduct of that little uh, role play. Try that again with another critical incident. Um, teacher and students after role playing this in a couple of times will get feedback, um, looking at ways they did it well, looking at ways they could improve it, looking at what language they might need to work on, whether it's conceptual, whether it's uh, linguistic, whether it's interpersonal, what are the skills that are there, and then uh, we can move on to kind of wrapping up the lesson. Uh, what other ways could we have resolved that conflict? Was it good to put people 
face to face with a mediator in the middle? Is there other ways of diffusing the situation? Would you have done it by email? Would you have done it in a different way uh, to give a kind of a wholeness to the lesson? And then there's a, a homework task for, for them to, to uh, write up one of the uh, uh, their opinion as one of the participants in the role play so they can they can see how this might uh, emerge into written form. So we can see a, a kind of fairly typical task based uh, lesson structure there that's focusing on giving the students the opportunity to demonstrate their um, ability to do the skills that were described at the B2 level. Remember those skills were, or those, um, those competencies were asking questions as the mediator, identifying common ground, outlining the main points between the two people, uh, summarizing and trying to find agreement uh, and obstacles to agreement. So the mediators had the opportunity to do all those things as part of the role play. And now we have a, 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 an opportunity within that lesson to, to feed in support, to give the language input, to give other input to, to support this. And you can see perhaps, I think here, um, that although this may have a very linguistic focus, it's not wholly focused on, on language skills. The, the skills that may be brought to bear may be ones that are very useful when you're doing uh, this kind of activity in your first language. So we're no longer talking about the CEFR as only describing second language proficiency. There are aspects of mediation which are um, developed within your first language as well. And so that this idea of language A and language B suddenly become a little bit um, uh, more blurred. And it's, it's fine to, to involve a first language speaker and a second language speaker in the same task when we're talking about mediation, because they'll bring different resources to bear, but they still have areas to develop this competence. Um, so we're not just talking about, about linguistic competence by any means here. Um, we've got this kind of lesson plan structure, but how are we going to measure whether it's been achieved? Well, there are all sorts of ways we might we might choose to, to measure this competence here. Um, we might ask the students to use those CFR descriptors to, to self-assess. Do they feel they were able to do those things as they're described um, at B2 level? We might design a checklist that, that simplifies the, the language in the CFR descriptors into um, functional checklist areas. Did you do this? Um, we may ask the group to create scales of uh, successful mediation from that that role play that we might get them to to to, to set criterion points for, for what was effective uh, mediation in that context um, we might ask learners to look back at video we've made of them being the mediator in those role play tasks and then to use video to um, to self-assess their own performance we might ask uh, one person to uh, look at um, how the role plays were, were set up so have four people in a group rather than three and ask an ex one uh, students to play the role of observer using a checklist, making uh, a list of good points, uh, positives and, and areas that could be worked on, obviously being sure that that, that peer support would um, uh, would be positive rather than, than critical. Um, or we might use the teacher as, as the assessment. Can the teacher go around and observe during those little task cycles, during those little role plays? Um, is it that we ask a particular group to, to perform their task again so the teacher can, can observe that and, and uh, measure their competence in that way? Maybe the, the assessment comes through the, the emails that are produced as homework. There are all sorts of ways in which we can, we can uh, get in there to find those measurement opportunities, to find those uh, possibilities for, for describing performance and supporting future improved performance. And we don't just need to do this with the, the single um, facilitating communication in delicate situations and disagreement scales. We've got all sorts of other CEFR scales available to us in this, in this vast resource, which might support that. Some of the scales which might be useful to also describe performance in this particular lesson structure and assessment structure I've listed here. It might be that the scale for formal discussion may be appropriate, the way that this was conducted in a more formal or less formal way the way students were able to take the floor in that uh, interaction. Obviously, in a heated discussion, it's very much more difficult to take the floor. You have to really assert yourself, or the mediator has to make sure they're giving opportunities. The cooperating scales, the asking for clarification scales, the scales of grammatical accuracy might be useful, the scales of phonological control that have been hugely developed in the new companion volume. Um, all of these might be useful for, for building out assessment criteria, which allow us to get to the, get to the um, the real heart of what's involved in successfully mediating um, as described in the CEFR. 
Now I'm talking about using a lot of scales and a lot of descriptors together, uh, and I want to make you aware of uh, of one tool which would be potentially useful to you for doing this. If you're if you're happy with this model of going from the competence through to individual descriptors, through to lesson planning, and through to opportunities for assessment, then where do you access the scales in a way that makes you comfortable that you're using them um, in combination? Well, well. Uh, at Nile, we've just launched a, a new membership area, which is completely free, uh, free to anybody who wants to sign up for a membership account. There's lots of great resources developed by us at, at Nile in, in Norwich here. Uh, the one particular one I want to draw your attention to is a, is a CEFR tool. Um, if you go to, if you sign up for membership and you become a, a member of um, uh, of Nile at our website, which is nile-elt.com. Um, then down at the bottom, we've got the CEFR filtering tool. And what the CEFR filtering tool allows you to do is to look at a, um, all the CEFR scales in a, in a spreadsheet format. And that spreadsheet format allows you to filter the, um, the CEFR scales just to access the ones you use. So if you, if you choose which particular filter you're interested in, you choose only mediating a text, for example, and then you choose the level that you're interested in with the filter over here, you can very, quickly and accurately access the scales which are relevant to a particular competency. So you can access the mediating a text descriptors at B1, and you can see down here on the right, all of the descriptors at B1 that are relevant to that particular area of the CFR are listed for you to copy, to, to put into your, your lesson planning and assessment structure to make sure that as an, uh, as an a priori way of aligning to the CFR, you're using the scales at the right level the right language and not changing the language which defines competence at a particular level. So it's a, it's a really useful tool for taking um, the CFR and making it manageable and accessible uh, and level specific and, and competence specific or strategy specific and hopefully you'll, you'll take advantage of that. Um, do uh, remember not to save the changes uh, when you, when you um, close that spreadsheet after you've been using it because uh, you want to have uh, no filters on when you start, so all the scales are, are accessible to you. So that's a, a free resource accessible through the, the Nile membership platform. So what I've been trying to do is to operationalize um, mediation. I've been trying to, to mediate uh, the mediation competences for you. Uh, if you go out of, uh, of this webinar and, and talk to someone who has no background in teaching and teaching of languages or the CEFR and describe what, what uh, you heard in this session, you'll be mediating. You'll be mediating the concepts, you'll be mediating the, the, the verbal text and the, and the visual text that you've seen for somebody else. What we've tried to look at, and here I'm um, using the mediation scale of relaying specific information in speech, is to look at the nature of the CEFR, how it's progressed, how it's misinterpreted, how I believe it's fundamentally organized and arranged, how we've looked at mediation as a scale that's been developed in the companion volume, how I've tried to prove to you that um, mediation is a really important real world professional and academic skill. And I've tried to illustrate that by saying what great mediators teachers have to be in the classroom, um, because it's uh, teachers who have these competences as part of their professional setup, and how we can share these competences particularly the mediation competences when we operationalize the scales for, for a learning situation, for teaching opportunities, and for ways of measuring that competence in, in uh, appropriate ways. Remembering back to not all the scales are suitable for examining, some of them may be suitable for teacher-led assessment, but all of them potentially uh, useful for, for self-assessment and goal setting. Um, so hopefully I've mediated the concept of mediation for you in a, in a uh, an acceptable and accessible way and thank you very much for listening and I'm going to hand back to Federica to uh, to wrap up or, or to see if there are any um, any specific questions though with so many people in the room it might be difficult to, to conduct question answer it's been a pleasure talking to you thanks very much hi Tom thank you so much thank you everyone for attending